Hi, this is Marcia. And this is Kelly. We are the two U's of Two U's Fiber Adventures. Thanks for stopping by. You'll hear about knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and just about anything else we can think of as a way to play with string. We blog and post show notes at Two U's fiberadventures.com and we invite you to join our two use fiber adventures group on Ravelry. I'm 100 projects and I am better in motion. We're both on Instagram and Ravelry and we look forward to meeting you there. Enjoy Enjoy the the episode. episode. Hi Kelly. Hey Marsha. How's it going? Pretty good. Good. It's we're, 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 Oh, go ahead. <laughs> it's feeling almost like spring here. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. It's not here. <laughs> <laughs> it does not feel like spring, but I will. I'm going to post a picture on Instagram soon that I um, came, took Enzo out for a walk. When I came back into the yard, I noticed that I have some little, um, I think there's snowdrops that are up out of the ground and they're blooming. Oh, nice. So, there's signs of spring. Yeah. Uh, well, the we temperature always temperature is not signs of spring. Yeah, it's it's cooler here too, but we always have a really really pretty President's Day weekend. Mm-hmm. It's almost never bad weather. I mean, I, I hardly can remember having bad weather on President's Day weekend. Bad weather on oh, my nice. birthday. Bad weather on stitches where when it used to be like right after President's Day weekend, I can remember that having mm-hmm. bad weather at stitches, but Almost always President's Day weekend is gorgeous, and this one is no exception. Um, I was okay. outside yesterday, and I actually I was wearing a black – I was wearing my black um, Neighborhood Fiber Company hoodie. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a T-shirt. It's not a sweatshirt. And um, weeding, and I actually got hot. Oh, okay. So now it was not hot in the shade. <laughs> once the once the sun moved and I was in the shade, I wasn't hot anymore. But I was actually feeling a little bit warm. And I thought, okay, this is nice. <laughs> well, I'm laughing because I'm arriving on the 27th of February to go to Stitches. Um, and I'm sure it will be cold because I'm, <laughs> I am arriving. <laughs> yes. And that's, that's a time of, of February that can be nasty weather so you're probably right Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) very end of february beginning of march yeah we don't always have good weather right then but Mm -hmm. little tiny window of president's day weekend the first um this is off topic i won't go too far off topic because we've got all the questions to answer but the first president's day weekend that i lived here in salinas it was my first semester teaching at hartnell and um, Robert was still living in Fremont, so we were living apart. I was living at my aunt's, and it wasn't like this. It was a gorgeous weekend after terrible weather, and he was coming, and I was so excited that, I, you know, he was coming for the weekend, and it was going to be nice, and we were going to be able to sit outside at my aunt's um, little gazebo table, and she had a little fountain, and, you know, hadn't seen him in weeks and stuff, and and he didn't arrive, and he didn't arrive, and he didn't arrive. I was like, what in the heck is wrong? Why is he not here? Anyway, he arrives. And this is, and this is, this is before cell phones, so you couldn't check right. on him. Right. This was 1988. So, like, what in the heck? Why is he taking so long? Well, and then he did call and say he was just leaving. And I'm like, mm. what in the heck is wrong? Why is he leaving so late? I was mad. I wasn't worried. I know he called to tell me he was coming because I wasn't <laughs> worried. I was mad. Anyway, mm-hmm. he arrives. He had bought a car. <laughs> <laughs> he had bought I the was Honda. Not a- Oh. I was so funny because I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah, no, he had been out buying a car. Like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to be oh visiting your wife who you haven't seen in weeks, not buying a car. <laughs> <laughs> that she doesn't oh even know about and should be a partner to the decision about. Oh my gosh! We yeah, had, we had been married. What we had been married like four years. He did a lot of that in the first 
<laughs> yeah. um, well, I, I, not to go off topic at all, but I, there's a few purchases I know of that were yeah. not uh, planned. Um, yes. But let's not speak of that. One of them chimes in your entrance hall um, on the hour. Oh, yes. <laughs> Wasn't the grand? <laughs> yeah, that was actually a, a Christmas. That was actually a Christmas present, but not a planned, oh, it was. Okay. Not a planned Christmas. I mean, not a okay. Not a Christmas present I expected. Yeah. Okay. That we're talking about the grandfather clock oh, yeah. in your uh, entrance hall anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, uh I'm going to reel us back in because we do mm-hmm. have um a lot to talk about. Um I am just going to say um I did um Kelly you and I have talked about this but um I haven't talked about it in the podcast yet but Kim and I went to the weaving workshop on Vashon Island through the um it's called the um actually I have to look at my notebook I forgot. Uh, it's called the Willingham Weavery on Vashon Island, Washington. And um, I will not talk about it in this episode because we just want to get to questions. And I actually am going to, uh, Kim and I will record something about our experience at the weaving class. Let me just say, though, it was fantastic. That's the fr- I mean, It was super fun. And I will tell people, because I they know this probably if they follow me on Instagram, is that I came home with a loom. Yay! <laughs> they, that that um, I said to Kim... Should we just take that? They offered it free, and there was nine students in the class, and seven of them already had their looms, so nobody wanted it. And I said to Kim, should we just take it and put it in my basement, because she doesn't have room at her house. So it's in my basement. It's a Harrisville, and it's um, four harness, um, and I, I don't... F- Well, the overall dimensions, I think it's like 44 inches wide, but I think the weaving area is probably about 36 inches. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to do a little research on it. I was looking at a blog post with somebody who had the same um, or a similar uh, loom. um, And she said that on the bottom of the loom, they have a number uh, and you can contact Harrisville and they'll tell you when the loom was manufactured. I have not found a number yet. Uh, but I need someone to help me turn it over better than what I was just like lifting it up and looking underneath. Yeah. It. Um, so I have to figure that out. And, but it's not a young thing. It's, uh, the teacher had had it for 25 years and it had been given to her by someone who had used it, but no longer used it. So I, I'm kind of curious to know, we know it's at least 25 years old. Right. I don't know how, mm-hmm. um, so interested to learn more about it. But anyway, That's I'll cool. talk more about the the spinning class, excuse me, the weaving class um, in another episode. But let's get back to our questions. All because right. Our last episode was the first part of our, our questions. And now this episode is going to be the second part. And we need to get, get cracking on this and get through <laughs> yeah. these questions because there's so many questions. Um, so... Um, I'm going to read the, um, our first question and it's from Ella, who is Griff Knock girl. And I met Ella at the Caithness craft retreat in Scotland. Do you remember when we, yep, in, mm-hmm. um, uh, yes, I was very jealous. Our, yes. <laughs> and, uh, I would love to go back, but anyway, um, Ella and I were, um, uh, I sat next to Ella quite a bit, quite a bit. And, um, we also did the trivia contest. Uh, we were partners in that. So anyway, it was super fun. But anyway, <clears throat> she said, what have been your favorite yarn-based trips and or events? And do you have any advice or tips for getting the most out of um, trips and events? So I'll say, I'll, I'll go first, yeah. Kelly. Because I've had some, I mean, we both have had yarn based trips, but mine was a, mine have been a little bit different where I've gone out of the country and kind of fiber focused going to mills. And, mm-hmm. and so like the, um, the, the two trips to Scotland, um, we went to mills, we went to the retreat, which was, I mean, really fun. And then, um, the Iceland trip was also fiber focused going to mills, going to farms, you know, producers, whatnot. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give my advice. I, well, I, my my first piece of advice is I think it's really nice when you travel uh, anywhere in the in the U.S. or overseas. It's always nice to kind of have something 
It doesn't have to be fiber, but just anything is kind of a framework for your trip. So, um, and that, and what's nice about the fiber is it becomes kind of, as I say, kind of a framework. So like the Scotland trip, it was all planned around going to the Caithness craft retreat, which is up in John O'Groats, which is on the very Northern coast of Scotland, which then we did research and discovered there is the North coast 500, which is this beautiful road that goes all the way around the highlands and in the North of Scotland. So then we attached that to it. And then we attached mills to it. And then we attached, you know, a whiskey tour, you know, private day long whiskey tour. Mm -hmm. And so like all these things sort of then fall into place when you kind of have a um, kind of a focus of what you want to do. Uh, Yeah. Um, It kind of narrows down because otherwise, otherwise when you're going somewhere, there's so much to see and do mm -hmm. that you can kind Mm -hmm. of get overwhelmed and that mm-hmm. give this that gives you kind of a focus to say, all right, I'm only lo- I'm really looking at these kinds of things. Yeah, and it's interesting too with the fiber. I think especially in the United Kingdom and in Scotland is that you you learn a lot about the history mm-hmm. of the country through the history of of um, the manufacturing and the producing of right. wool and uh, right. milling it, and then you also learn what's going on in contemporary. Uh, mm-hmm. in a country, you know, in, in the current current times. Um, well, and yeah. if you think about, I mean, as you were saying that, I was thinking the two most important things in history were food and clothing, mm-hmm. right? I mean, really, if you think mm-hmm. about it, food and clothing. So exactly. that's so that's fiber and food. Um, mm-hmm. And lots of people go on trips around the food, like food and wine tours and stuff. So it's not that. It's not really that nutty. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> to do a fiber tour. <laughs> yeah. And then since you mentioned food, I'm just going to throw out here too, this is not fiber related, but we I think we've agreed just now that they're connected, is we did not do this in Scotland, but in Iceland, the group that we travel with, they had organized a uh, cooking class. Mm-hmm. And... Kim and I came away from that feeling like no matter where we go, what country we travel to, we would take a cooking class because, again, it's such an introduction to the country, mm-hmm. learning about the food. So yeah. um, that would be my tip for travel. Um, yeah. Well, and it's a it's a good way to um, have a more a more social visit. Both things, fiber mm-hmm. and food, mm-hmm. is a good way to mm-hmm. have a more social visit than just like visiting historical sites or museums or, mm-hmm. you know, you, you don't have as much social interaction when you're doing those things. If if you're not a very social person, like my Aunt Betty could go to any of those mm-hmm. places and she would have us, and you too <laughs> probably would have a social, mm-hmm. you know, would it would be mm-hmm. like a social activity. If I went mm-hmm. to those places, I could go to those places and leave those places and never talk to a single person. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah that that would be really good. If you're not an extrovert, I think that's a really good way. I mean, especially if you're not an extrovert, I would say that's a really good piece of advice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about you? Hmm. <laughs> well, I haven't. I haven't really done fiber travel per se but i even before we had the podcast um when i you know back when i was first knitting and spinning i would um look in the as soon as we got to the hotel you know so again pre cell phone days as soon as we got to mm-hmm. wherever we were staying one of the first things i would do is get the phone book out of the nightstand and go mm-hmm. to the yellow pages and look for a yarn shop Yes, and so I would do that too. Yeah, and so I went to I, you know I've been to a lot of yarn shops in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. You know, go to a work conference, find a yarn shop, and the piece mm-hmm. of advice that I would give is, if you know you're going somewhere, uh, give a call to the yarn shop to see if they have a knitting a knitting hour. Um, I was mm-hmm. in the I, I we mentioned the Washington D.C. You know, when we talked about the your mm-hmm. your plans for a trip to Washington D.C. in the last episode. Um, that I went to looped and, but just by accident it was the middle of the day, they were having a knitting group. And so I just sat down with them and knitted, 
but I think that would be something that I that I will do in the future more is mm -hmm. if I'm going to be somewhere for a length of time, find out when they have their knit nights. And some I have tried it in other trips and haven't been able to, you know, make it work, but yeah. I think that would be I think that would be the one of the pieces of advice that that I would give. Mhm. Mm yeah, I when I was um I when I I've not really had a lot of opportunity just like short trips to do that, but um, when we would go down to Seabrook on the Washington coast, when the yarn shop was there, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is now sadly closed, but Jean, the owner would always have a, I was a sip and knit and you could go, it was kind of cool because you could go to the wine bar next door and get a glass of wine or a pint of beer and then just take it over to the yarn shop and sit there and have it while you, um, she would, I think she did like on Thursdays. So it was kind of fun to, if I was down there, I always would do that. It was fun because I got to know some of the people there. Right, you know? right. Um, so, um, okay. Um, have we answered that? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. And this is Lori LaCours. And she says, my question is, if time and money are not a constraint, what would your Magnus Opus fiber project be? Kelly, how about you want to go? Yes. So mine is actually one that I was planning. Um, and I decided that the money and the time weren't a constraint for this. But what is a constraint is that the yarn I want is discontinued. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So and that is the um, blanket by Mona Zilla that's called Such is the Quality of Bees. And I knit mm -hmm. the pillow because uh, she has a pillow with the same design on it. It's a color work pattern. I knit the pillow um, with uh, Druid Hill and Oliver. Those are both color colorways from Neighborhood Fiber Company in their Neighborhood Fiber Company worsted. And then I went and I went to Stitches in 20... 19 right before yeah our last stitches before the pandemic i went to stitches in 2019 and i looked all over for druid hill and it's found out it was discontinued but mm -hmm. um the woman we talked to said i could call and they do dyeing they do dye pot days where they you know where people come in and take a dyeing class and then and then can buy a dye pot you know mm -hmm. and she said maybe i could buy a dye pot and they would do that and then the pandemic happened and I never contacted, I never, I never contacted uh, Karita to find out if that was going to be possible. And so now I, but I'm sitting here with enough, very expensive yarn, <laughs> very much of the yarn um, that mm -hmm. all the yellow, the Oliver that I need, I have purchased already. So now I just have to purchase the, the missing color if I can, if I can do it. And so I have a question. So the idea is that you go dye it yourself or will they dye it for no, you? No, they would dye it for me and then oh, I, okay. I would pay to have it dyed as part of this dye oh, okay. day. Okay. As though I were there, but not. Mm -hmm. And then they would ship it. Because aren't they, because uh, her shop is near DC, isn't it? Yes. So if I go to the DC trip, I thought, well, I'll go dye it for you. But Well, you could. For you. Well, you could. If you are going to do that. Um, in some, you know, some period of time before I have figured out how to make this work. Um, yeah, that would be great, Marcia. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <Okay>. No pressure. <laughs> uh, okay. So, yeah, and, and my plan, it's a color work blanket. Um, and because I, I saw one done this way in the project pages, it's, a, um, it's not a double knit blanket mm -hmm. the pattern but someone did it as a double knit so you can mm -hmm. imagine how expensive this is going to be oh yeah um, yeah because it's twice as much yarn to make this double knit blanket mm -hmm. so yes that would be my magnum opus i may never get to it mm -hmm. i may just have this gold yarn um <laughs> in my stash <laughs> As a sad thing, and then mm -hmm. there is one other that I that I have in my in my queue that I might do maybe 
it's a long shot. Um, it's a it's called Thornley by Jennifer Beale, and it's a long vest in very mm-hmm. small color work. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's eleven colors. Oh wow! Of color work, and I would do it in eleven colors of hand spun from that sheep, jazz man. That was the uh, the Judith McKenzie. She judged it. Oh, right. Harshly right, right. because it was in the wrong class, but it actually said mm-hmm. it was. I forget the exact words, but I wrote the, her exact words about it. Kind of like a fleece to die for, but it's in the wrong class. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I would use that because it's a three color. It's, you know, it's a multicolor. It was, the sheep was, has white, gray, and black. Um, in its fleece, and then I could also dye it, and I could get 11 colors of hands spun mm-hmm. to, to do this project. So those are my thoughts about my mm-hmm. magnum opus that I might never do. What about you? Well, well, I put down, um, this is not knitting or crocheting or weaving, but uh, a Persian rug. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but I think it'd be kind of interesting to do a knotted rug. Uh-huh. Um, and then I also put down... Um, I, if I ever get married again, which I'm not ever, <laughs> I would, <laughs> if time I, I would if knit, time or reality is not a constraint, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would knit a wedding dress. Oh my! And gosh. um, I have to. Well, no, I know. And so, um, do you remember um our good friend Mary Knit Admin? She tells the story mm-hmm. of helping this woman knit a dress. Um, and then, but what was really inspiring is there's a woman, um, she's a designer and she's Kika and she's on Instagram. She's, um, looks like Kuto Vakika. Uh, it's, she's in, she's Finnish and it's K-U-T-O-V-A-K-I-K-A. And she also has a YouTube channel and that's where I watched her making this wedding dress for her wedding. And she does it in about six weeks and she combines crochet and knitting and it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So she kind of inspired me that even though she was making a wedding dress, I'm not going to make a wedding dress, but it'd be kind of interesting to make a dress. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are some... I will say looking on Ravelry, there's some that you're like, "Mm, I don't think so. And there's a couple that are really, really good looking, really nice. So I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but, um, um, you know, I would make it in a color that's not white. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that would be quite a... One of my friends at work um, who teaches computer science, Emily, she made, she crocheted her wedding dress. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, to see yeah. the pieces come together and, yeah, that's ambitious, I think. Very ambitious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say, if you watch the video, there are certain points where she's in tears because she's doing this in six weeks. Um, and they've moved into a new house and, <laughs> like, it's all – and she has to – they're moving out of the apartment and cleaning. And, you know, you know how right. much hard moving right. is and how hard – planning a wedding is and then you're going to make your own dress in six weeks sort it's, of like the story of how mary got involved in mm-hmm. yeah working yeah. on the dress for the woman yes. that she helped yeah yeah so anyway um that's a cool question yeah yeah okay i'll keep going here so merit her question is uh is she says my question is for both of you which fiber craft is the first that you learned are there any other types of non-fiber related crafts that you do or want to learn? Um, well, I think my, I don't, well, I don't know. I, I, what are we talking about craft? I mean. Well, like um, I, I, I would count your baking. Yeah. I started baking at a really young age, like seven eight mm-hmm. i had a i don't i had a bread business for a while like when i was in elementary or middle school i was making bread i had sourdough starter i was making bread every saturday and selling it to the neighbors um <laughs> it was a great business model for me not for my parents because my mother had to buy all the ingredients and then i would just <laughs> sell bread. 
Well, <laughs> did you? And of um, course, you didn't give her any money for the. I didn't give her any money. No. Uh, no, I didn't give her any money for my profits. But um, and then I always did a lot of painting. I took. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. I did uh, after school, and we were in ele- my brother and I were in elementary school, and uh, my mother had a friend who lived in the neighborhood and was an artist, and we would walk to her house after school for um, art lessons and then walk home. And we did that for a long time, I think up until all through middle school, maybe into high school. And my mother and father saved all of that. And some of them they framed and I did not know what to do with them. So they're all hanging in the garage now. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't have the heart to throw them out, but I didn't want them hanging in my house. So they're hanging in the garage. But I always done, and then ceramics. I always did a lot of ceramics in college and at the community college. And um, I took, and at Whitman, there was a ceramics class I took. I was um, never brave enough else? to do that. Oh, I really? I don't know why. I don't know why it felt like I needed bravery to take a ceramics class, but it did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and the cooking, but then I don't know what else I do in terms of craft. I don't know. I can't think of anything else. I would, but what about you, Kelly? I think the earliest, well, I think crochet was probably the earliest thing I did just Mm -hmm. in terms of crafts. But I, I, I started sewing in third or fourth grade. Third grade, I think. Oh, yeah. The very first thing I sewed, my mom called it a flower sack dress. <laughs> and it basically had, I mean, it was basically like a pillowcase, but um, mm-hmm. no, no, to- you know, you know, how a, it was a piece of fabric open at both ends. So you sew a tube together, right? Mm-hmm. And then at the top of that tube, you actually don't sew it all the way up because you have armholes. Mm hmm. And then you, at the top of the tube, you sew a casing and you put a drawstring through it and that's your neck. It's like a halter mm-hmm. dress kind of, or a mm-hmm. spaghetti strap dress kind of. So it's mm-hmm. gathered in the front, gathered in the back, open at the arms. And mm-hmm. so we made those. And then, yeah, I made a lot of clothes when I was, when I was young. Yeah, and I, I forgot we talked about that in the last episode, but I did a lot of sewing too. Mm-hmm. I sewed all mm-hmm. my clothes. And even, I and yeah. yeah, you said you made that suit. Mm-hmm. When I was in so I took four H and I took so you know, when I was in four H, so I started four H in fourth grade and I had this I took sewing. And I did not take sewing in middle school because by the point I was in seventh grade, I had made jackets and dresses and Mm -hmm. the last thing i wanted to do was go into a class where i would have to make an apron you know Mm -hmm. make a pillowcase and then make an apron and then make it like all that to me is like okay i am i am not a beginner and i don't need i don't want to take a class where i start as a beginner so i didn't take sewing um in in middle school but i also did latch hook rugs Mm -hmm. they were kind of all the rage when i was when i was a kid um, I, I still have one that I made as a, it's a Christmas design. And so we just, we put it out every year for Christmas and the dogs like to lay on it. <laughs> I, I should really, I should really make them their own latch hook rugs because, mm-hmm. because they're kind of fun and, and mm-hmm. goodness knows I, I could probably find enough yarn. You know, if I went into yeah. my weaving stash, I could definitely cut up enough enough you could have hand yarn. spun hand spun latch hook mm-hmm, rugs. Mm-hmm. no i could i could make i could make them latch hook rugs they really like it that latch hook rug they you know barry he was so big and the rug is so little <laughs> and mm-hmm. at, at christmas time he would curl himself up into this littlest ball so he could try to fit mm-hmm. on this tiny little rug mm-hmm. so and, th- and at that time it was you know acrylic yarn that came already cut but but yeah, that might be a fun project to go back to. I liked doing. Mm-hmm. I liked doing latch hook. I should teach my niece, my grandniece. Um, I don't know. I don't know what. Eight, she's eight. That's probably old enough to oh, yeah. manage a latch hook. She had a hard yeah. time. She had a hard time with knitting when we tried it, but 
but maybe a latch hook. Anyway, so yeah, that's um, those were kind of my first. And then non-fiber related crafts. I don't know if you call it crafts, but the piano has been really fun. Mm -hmm. And then I, I might have talked about this on the podcast at one point. I really don't have any desire to do baking, you know, like like what you do with your mm -hmm. your cakes and all. So cooking is not it's not that fun for me. But I saved a pattern or a a pattern. <laughs> I saved a <laughs> recipe called um, Princessa Tarta, mm -hmm. made by Mary Berry, and it's right. this green fondant over cake with all this different kind of cream and custard filling. Like, I really want to, I found, I, I don't even know how I came to it, but at the time I was watching the British baking show during the pandemic. I was, mm -hmm. you know, watching the old episodes of it. And somehow I, I, I know I was not looking for cake recipes. That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a true fact. I would not have been looking for a cake recipe. But I found this and it was just so bright green that it attracted mm -hmm. me. And I thought, I'm going to make this cake. And it's like, you know, six hours or something, you know, the estimated time. So mm -hmm. that's another one of those magnum opus things that may or may not happen. <laughs> <laughs> But it looks like um, fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have sourdough starter. I'm feeding my starter right now. It's in the, and I've discovered, Kelly, this is a little side note. I've discovered the best place to put my starter, if I want to really get it grow growing, is in the bathroom downstairs. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so, it's right above the furnace, so it gets really, really warm mm -hmm. in there. It's like a proofing box in there. So it's it's down there. Uh, see if we can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make... Um, English muffins okay. tomorrow. So I have to. Well, anyway, that okay. reminds and me then, of another. That reminds me of another craft, Marcia. The hot bathroom, mm -hmm. because another craft that I remember doing when I was a kid is paper mache. Oh, making right, yeah. things out of paper mache, and then we would put yeah. them in the bathroom to dry because we had a bathroom yeah. like that. That you know, if the heater was on, the bathroom got really hot if you closed the door. And so my mom mm -hmm. would put our stuff in the bathroom and close the door so that our paper mache <laughs> could dry faster. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember doing paper mache, all that stuff. Okay. Um, uh, okay, listen, Next. moving on. Okay, um, Sue, Ferret Sue asked, I would like to ask what the first fibers were that you both spun and what the first ever knitted item was that you made for yourselves. Um, I can be really quick, Kelly. Okay. I, I'm 100% sure my first fiber was Corey Dale because that's what you recommended <laughs> yeah. for um, a first time spinner. And that's the uh, my first yarn that was like rope. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I know that was the first fiber. And then uh, my first sweater I made was a pullover. I still have the pattern in my collection and I still have the sweater. And the yarn was Arlen Swalane. Um, is a wool. It's I actually looked it up to answer this question. I looked up the um. I remembered the name of the yarn. It was Swalane. I didn't remember the name of the manufacturer, but I looked it up and it's discontinued. Um, which makes sense because it's forty years ago. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that sweater. <laughs> um, but I still have it, and I and this is the one I always talked about this once too that I never wore it. I never finished it. I, I. I fit, it was, again, it's one of those sweaters where it's basically a square with two rectangles sticking off the side mm -hmm. for sleeves. Mm -hmm. And I had finished the whole sweater and I'd sewn up one sleeve and I just had to finish up, finish sewing up the side and the second sleeve. And I never did that. I was done. Oh my gosh. Why, <laughs> so one so day why I didn't it. you, why didn't you do it? I don't know. Do I have remember? no idea. Oh, you don't even. No, remember. I have no idea why Had I didn't you, do you, it. I, well, you must have lost interest in that sweater by that time. It decided you didn't have. like the know. color or something. I don't know because it's a beautiful color. It's sort of a turquoise, aqua color. It's beautiful. Hmm. So I don't know. I was thinking the other day I should um, re knit, just rip it out and re knit yeah. it because. Mm -hmm. I don't really like that style where it's a box with two rectangles for sleeves because uh -huh. it, do it doesn't fit very well through the you know in the armhole kind of. Mm -hmm. So I should just re knit a sweater with that. Yeah, yarn, if you like the nice. yarn, yeah, yeah. Anyway, how about you? 
Hmm. So the first fiber that I spun was something I got at the spinning day, um, something I got at the spinning day that Anne's web had. It was white, probably meat sheep or Corydell or, you know, people discarded wool from someone. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think it was not commercial roving. It was probably, it was probably a carded, a carded roving. Maybe, maybe, com- you know, maybe carded at a mill, but, mm-hmm. um, but it wasn't like top. It was more like the stuff that comes off my carter. So yeah. I have no idea what it was. I spun it with a piece of a hanger bent into a hook. And oh, right, right. I know I've talked about this before, so I won't go mm-hmm. into a lot of detail, but I got obsessed. I mean, this is how I knew that my soul was a spinner because I got I got totally obsessed by spinning this wool with this hook because I didn't have a spinning wheel. And they had mm-hmm. drop spindles. Um, in those days, we made, you know how you got CDs from AOL and you got CDs from, I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, Earthlink and all those different places, you'd get like, you know, a CD a week. And, um, and well, and maybe at that time I learned, no, it was in the, it was in the 90s. So yes, there would have been these, these CDs all over the place. Anyway, they made uh, drop spindles out of CDs. And so we did use the drop spindles, but I was not coordinated enough mm-hmm. to do those. It, it felt like big movement to do a drop spindle and little mm-hmm. movement to do the hook. And so I didn't mm-hmm. need to organize things in the big way. Anyway, it just was so much more comfortable and I just got obsessed. And so I was spinning that way. Um, and then the fiber that I pro- that I first spun on the wheel, I had bought some eggplant colored roving, probably Ashland Bay, not a Merino, mm-hmm. maybe a, Corydale or maybe just a blend of some kind. It was commercial top. And I had bought it when when I went back to the spinning wheel place and told her, yes, <laughs> yes, please, I want to buy that wheel. <laughs> and she said, well, you could get one with better, more modern, you know, more features because he's been changing the design as he goes if you order it f- fr- from him. And so once mm-hmm. again, I was thwarted in my plan to have a wheel that day. Uh, but mm-hmm. I did buy I did buy fiber from her that day that I could continue to do my um, spindle spinning or hook spinning. And I bought a Takli, which looked a lot like the hook idea. And and then so the leftovers of that I used to spin. That was the first thing I first thing I spun on on the wheel. And then the first ever knitted item that I made, I made, I didn't make a lot of stuff for myself at first. I made a hat for Robert out of Cotswold. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm laughing because because Cotswold is very, very itchy. And I made mm-hmm. him a pair of socks out of that same Cotswold fleece that I bought and spun. Um, so he had super itchy socks and super itchy hat, <laughs> but I, I mean, that's why I wouldn't have made anything for myself. Cause at that time I just thought this is all going to be really itchy. Mm-hmm. So I can't even remember the first thing I made for myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I did make, but my early knitting was a hat and a pair of socks. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, our next question is from Colleen T and Knitting Two, and she asks, "What do you enjoy the most about podcasting?" And Kelly, what do you enjoy the most? Well, I'm looking at my show notes, and I, I know I'm looking at it too. That's why I'm deferring to you. Huh? I have no idea what I what happened. I have a feeling that I started to write something and got interrupted because here's what it says. <laughs> It says, what do I enjoy most about podcasting? Time. I have no, I have no idea. Oh, you know what? I think maybe one of the things that I was thinking of 
one of the things that I was thinking of is that we have a re- you and I have a regular time to talk together. Uh, mm-hmm. I I think maybe that's it. Because otherwise, yeah. I don't, I honestly don't remember why I <laughs> why I put that. But well, and- but it is true. I mean, mm-hmm. listeners might not might not realize this, but over the years that Marsha and I have been friends, this is probably the most since we've been podcasting. This is the most we've talked to each other. <laughs> you know, since I mean, since living apart. Right. This is the most we've talked yeah. to each other. I'm not very yeah, well, good because- at reaching out with a phone call or yeah. remembering. I'm. This sounds terrible, but I know this about myself. Well, we all know you're I'm, a terrible person. I am a terrible so. person. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. You know, like yeah. I love my friends, but when I don't see them, I don't miss them. I'm kind of like a dog in that <laughs> way. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm kind of like in the moment, you know, in, yeah. in that way. <laughs> no, it's terrible. <laughs> it's bad. It's a bad trait. I'm not a good friend. So this has been good because it's forced me to be a better friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. Well, but no, it's true because, you know, when we first, uh, when you, well, I was after college, I'm living in Seattle, you're living originally. Uh, First spoke um, Walla Walla, then Spokane, then you and Robert moved to California. And, you know, long distance cost money then. Yeah, um, yeah. It's not like now with cell phones. And so we didn't really talk on the phone that much. We wrote a lot of letters, but then we were sort of a little inconsistent about that, too. You know, mm-hmm. we're not. Uh, and so what I thought was kind of um, what was really great about cell phones is we could talk without the worry about the cost, you know, Mm -hmm. not initially, but now it's not an issue. But really the best feature of it is texting. Yes. Is Mm -hmm. that, I think that was the best part of staying connected because it's a lot of times those little things that, you know, you laugh about or what you made for dinner Mm -hmm. or, you know, what Ben was doing or, or what Enzo was doing, or you'd send me stuff about the dogs and this before Instagram Mm-hmm. You know, we would share stuff that way. Yeah. And and I think one of the um, reasons that I that I didn't reach out to people by phone is that when I did, it would be like I mean, we'd start talking like, oh, quick call, and it would be an hour and a half. And right, like, yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't have time to call Marsha because I don't have an hour and a half. Which yeah. is d- also yeah. dumb, right? I, I did see this yeah. thing in the New York Times about about eight minute phone calls. That you actually you make a point to call someone and you say, okay, I'm only I can only talk for eight minutes, but I just wanted to reach out and say hi and and I thought, oh, that that's kind of good because that is one of the things that kind of stops, you know, that kind of stops people is they think, okay, yeah. I do yeah. get going talking, and then it's an hour and a half, and I don't have that much time. Yeah, and a text yeah. is great because because you can you can just share a small thing that you want to mm-hmm. share without it turning into a much longer conversation. Yeah. But I would answer the question, the same thing as like, we have a regular um, day that we talk, uh, you know, every two weeks, we have this conversation, catch up on what's going on. Um, And I also like that, the idea that um, we're not just talking to each other, we're talking to our listeners as Mm -hmm. well. Um, And, um, and do you find during the during the time in between? <laughs> do you find it? During, no, I was going to say something. But okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say. Do you find during the time in between that you that you kind of wish you could text our listeners too? Like something you think yeah. of something, and it's like, oh, oh, wow! But we aren't podcasting again for two weeks. But I re- I I need yeah. to remember to say this, or I wish I I wish we were podcasting today because I'd add this into the conversation. Do you ever find mm-hmm. yourself thinking of things you want to say on the podcast and it's like, okay, I need to remember that, but... Yes. In fact, now that you say this, it's jogging my memory or something I meant to say at the beginning of the podcast uh, of this episode is I was walking Enzo and listening to our last episode, as I often do, and I was talking about uh, the, Olymp- the our trip around the Olympic Peninsula where the Cascade Mountain Range is. That is not true. <laughs> I spoke, there's two things I said. That was, and now, and now again, I can't remember what the second thing was, but the Cascade Mountain Range separates Washington State. It actually runs the entire, starts in Canada, runs down to, I don't know, California, I guess. And it 
um, separate Western Washington, which is the sort of the wet, wet side of the state from Eastern Washington, which is the dry part of the state. And the Olympic Peninsula has the Olympic Mountains, hence it's called the <laughs> Olympic Peninsula. So anybody who's local must have just been like yelling at me when I was saying that. So um, anyway, yes, there was sometimes a lot of times I, I listen to the podcast and I want to say something or I see something and want to say something. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Um, uh, okay. Moving on, Kelly. Well, was there um, something else you oh. wanted, or was that what you were laughing about when you started laughing? That you oh to no, what I, I started to laugh about. I, uh, I no. What I was going to say is that I sometimes uh, I think that about I like the idea that that listeners are you know they're included in the conversation. It feels like they are we're, we're talking to them, um, and then also we have had a lot of feedback that people really like the fact that it's uh, like, it feels like they're sitting with a group of friends knitting. And especially during the pandemic, it was really nice that um, we didn't dwell on the pan. We had touched on it, but we didn't dwell on the pandemic. And um, so it's a kind of a nice um, comfortable place to go, especially during the pandemic to kind of escape from all of that. Mm-hmm. You know? um, yeah. And, that was uh, nice to hear. I, yeah. I, mm-hmm. That was nice to hear. And then the part that I sort of laugh at is there is always fundamentally this part of me that is amazed that people still are listening to us <laughs> um, natter on, you know, like just yeah. talk. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's still always kind of amazing to me that um, st- people are still here with us. So um, anyway, that's what I was just sort of laughing about. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the next question is from Janie. And Stash46, and she asks, what fiber retreat slash festival is your favorite or your absolute favorite? And what is one you long to go to? And um, I said, I love Black Sheep Gathering and I love the Knockers Retreat because I know so many people there now that attend. And a lot of the people from the Knockers Retreat, uh, some of them come to Black Sheep Mm -hmm. and a lot go to Stitches. Um, we see people there. We're gonna. Um, we're already been in contact about meeting up at at Stitches um, when we're there. So that's just really nice. The um, so you know I, I those are probably my favorite. But then they're also really the only retreats I've really have gone to on a regular basis. Right. So I, um, and then um, yeah, uh, I would have to. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, although uh, I'm going to add one to the list. So, so yeah, I love knockers because there's nothing to do there. I mean, there's nothing you have to do there. That's the, my right, favorite yeah. thing about knockers mm-hmm. is that mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about anything except all the fiber I want to touch and play with. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. all the people to talk to and the food is there. Mm-hmm. It's all organized for me. I don't have mm-hmm. to think, Oh, where do I go to eat? Um, so that I think that would have to be uh, of all of them. I think that's my favorite. Um, but I'm going to add. Poor wi- there's I was going to say there's poor Wi-Fi, so you really can't check in with work. <laughs> right, exactly, and that's kind of <laughs> nice too. Yes, that's nice. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I want to add, I haven't gone in a long, long time, but I'm thinking I might try to go this year, and maybe I need to get online and 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 check out when is the when is the registration? But the Conference of Northern California Hand Weavers um, is kind of like stitches for weavers mm-hmm. in a way. They have um, classes and a marketplace every other year, and then on the years where, and then on the alternate years, they just have the the classes, and so it's just all weaving, like a weaving retreat where it's just classes and there's no there's no marketplace. And I went mm-hmm. one year when it was at a Silamar. That was where I did the wire. I just took one, I just took the class on wire weaving. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really, that was really fun. And I, I saw it, I saw something about it online and I thought, oh, I need to go and look at that website because I think I'd like to do that again where I just, even if it, I don't know if it's a year of the, of the, 
marketplace one or the year of just the workshop retreat version. But either one of those I found to be really, really fun. It was just hard. They were just hard to get to um, during the school year because it Mm -hmm. happened in April, I think, was the one I went to at Asilomar. Um, I don't know how I, I don't know how I did it during the school year. Maybe it was spring break. Maybe it happened to be my spring break and that's how I went. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, yeah. So I'm thinking I might want to try to go to the uh, Conference of Northern California Handweavers. Okay. Okay. And Janie had another question. Let's talk stash. How big? (laughs) Would it fill a bathtub or a sink? How do you feel about said stash? Other than fiber arts, what activity do you most enjoy? So, Kelly, do you want to talk about your stash? My stash, yes. Well, if you're talking about my knitting stash of hand spun and the yarn that I have actually bought for myself, so for knitting hand spun, hand spun that I would knit with and yarn that I've actually purchased for myself, and have on purpose, not spirit yarn, it might actually just fit in a sink, a big big sink, like maybe a garage Mm -hmm. utility sink. My utility sink. Yes, it might fit in your (laughs) utility sink. But if you include my weaving yarn and, well, and it doesn't, that doesn't include the shop yarn. (laughs) There's a lot of that. Um, that still needs to be dyed and done something with. But anyway, um, if you're talking about my weaving yarn and then you add in my spirit yarn, whether it's knitting spirit yarn or weaving spirit yarn, most of the spirit yarn is now weaving. Um, and then you add into that the hand spun rug yarn that I've made, you would probably need a jacuzzi. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> maybe a backyard hot tub <laughs> i think and then the fleeces mm, you need a closet i'd need like a walk-in closet yeah to for my fle- they're out in the garage but if i were try to think of the bathroom theme bathroom bedroom rooms in the mm-hmm. house theme i think a regular sized walk-in closet probably for my fleeces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's my stash and I feel great about it. I honestly feel pretty good about it. There's, there's some, there have been some moments. Well, last year when I laid it all out and looked at it and came to the realization that most of it was not yarn I had actually chosen, but had Mm -hmm. sort of rescued Mm-hmm. Like I didn't get it from a breeder. I went to the pound, and mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> or or someone dropped it off on my doorstep. <laughs> yeah, and and then the I foundling. started foundling, foundling yarn, foundling right? yarn. Yes, and I started thinking, hmm, man, I I need to get rid of some of this stuff that I really don't mm-hmm. that I don't think I'm going to use, and so I have done that. Um, and I then I used a whole bunch of it that I had been planning to use but had never done anything with. So I made quite a, I would say, a good size dent mm-hmm. in that. If if you guys saw the pile of yarn that I had on the sheet in the spare bedroom, I think I made a pretty good size dent in that over the course of the last mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. So, but there's still a lot. But I feel great about it. I love it all. Yeah. So I will say about my stash, I feel great about my stash. It feels like an artist palette, you know, like painters don't have too much paint. So why should knitters, crocheters, weavers, spinners have too much fiber, <laughs> right? It's mm-hmm. it's an artist palette is how I see it. Um, I don't have a lot of, uh, well, I did a big cleanup. What I did is when I did the cleanup in the basement, um, that whole project, um, I had all the my yarn just in these big giant plastic bins and that I'd got at the Goodwill, these bins. And so what I did is I still have got rid of some of those because I, I think I ended up getting rid of at least two, maybe three garbage bags full 
of yarn that I had bought at the Goodwill or I'd taken from the de stash room or something that I thought I'm just never going to use it. It's just time for it to go to somebody who's going to use it. So I got rid of all of a lot of that. Um, and then I just reorganized everything and I got boxes that are sort of like the size of shoe boxes, I think. And I could get two, I think I can get on the shelving unit, I think I can get 12 or 18 on there. No, 12 or four. I think it's 14 I can get along there. So then I labeled all those from lace weight all the way to uh, worsted weight. And then I just have like projects, the things that I know that I'm going to make. I have them in a bag. Those bags you get like sheets in or comforters mm-hmm. in. And yeah. I just put it in there with the um, the pattern. And so it just fills the the shelving unit, which is... I don't know, it's probably like five feet tall, six feet wide. Mm -hmm. So that's not too bad, right? Now it is highly compressed. (laughs) If you let it escape, if if you you let it escape from these... (laughs) It would fill a lot more bathtubs. It would fill a bathtub and it might overflow the bathtub. I will, honestly. Um, and then that's not, in, and that's my hand spun. And uh, I still have the little bits of hand spun that you sent me, Kelly, years ago, which oh, we yeah. talked about. And then, um, but then if you were to put in the the fleeces I have, you're talking, that, I mean, the fleeces probably fill another bathtub. Because I think in one episode, I think I have eight fleeces that, are mm-hmm. in various stages of being yeah worked on and so, a lot of and your all fleeces the fleeces are, are just in a fairly order. small because I think I have mm-hmm. ten but a lot of yours are like half like mm-hmm. we split it or you split it yeah. with someone else or mm-hmm. mine are like so I think your fleece your fleece stash is is even though you have eight and I have ten. I don't think they're, they're small. I don't. Yeah, I'm gonna. I was gonna say I don't think they're really comparable. <laughs> my favorite. No, it's not my it's favorite not size a, of fleece is ten pounds. <laughs> yes, and like one of them is. Uh, I have a Gotland, which I think is like two pounds or three yeah, pounds. Yeah. It's very small. I mean, it's not. I, I don't. And actually, the one that I have, I weighed it. Now I cannot remember. It was one that a friend gave me. It's a alpaca. It's like a huge thing. I don't know. It's, mm, I'm ex- mm-hmm. I don't know. It was it's definitely over six pounds because I weighed it not too long ago, but now I can't remember. And I don't know what I'm going to do with that because it's so much, you know. But anyway, um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay. Because uh, we are, we have a, we have to keep moving on this. Oh, <laughs> no, really. Um, so, yes, we do need to move along. <laughs> so, the next question is directed at me. And Iris, with three S's, says, my question is about the bees. What's going on with the bees, Kelly? Oh, well, sadly, the bees I bought last year are no longer with us. I don't know what happened. I, um, I'm trying to think when was the last time I saw them. I had two, I bought two packages last year and I was really looking forward to them lasting a while because I got some um, treatment free genetics from uh, Be Kind in Northern California. And the last time I had gotten bees from there, I, I didn't have it, you know, they really were very, uh, um, very sturdy. You know, mm-hmm. they, they split and they, I was able to split them and, um, make new hives and all of that. But part of the problem is that I didn't do that. I didn't, I I didn't manage them as well as I probably should have. And I didn't pay attention as well as I probably should have to what was going on. Um, Yeah. I'm going to have to figure out. So I might get a swarm come in, you know, my, my hives are out there and, and a lot of times they will attract a swarm. It's, it's not really warm. enough. This is the first week warm weekend. It's not really time to see a swarm yet Mm -hmm. um but i might i might get a swarm and and that would be nice if i could get a couple swarms to move in but yeah i have to get back into the rhythm of beekeeping you know it's 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 one of the chores that's on your list to go out there and you know do an inspection and see if you need to split them because they're getting ready to swarm or maybe they need 
food or maybe something's going on with the hive and you can see that this one hive is dying. And so then you want to see if you can split, you know, get a, get requeen and get, a, get a, another hive going before it's too late. And I didn't do any of that last year. Mm-hmm. I basically put them in the box, looked at them a couple times and then, and then didn't look at them again. I mean, I looked at them from the outside, <laughs> really? but I didn't, I didn't do any kind of management at all. I just kind of let them do their thing. And with Varroa mites, uh, you really have to do some kind of management, even with the, you know, genetics that are resistant. Um, if you're not going to treat them, you need to do some other kinds of management. And I didn't do it. So mm-hmm. my fault, I was a bad beekeeper. Mm-hmm. Bad bee mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But hopeful that I'll I'll be able to get back into the swing of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And uh, Jolene, uh, JoJo crafts a lot. She asked, is it too late to take my dog to training? We had good intentions when she was a puppy, but a year and five months later, all she really knows is sit and up when getting in the car. She is an Australian Labradoodle and is very smart and well-behaved for the most part. Is the big box pet store training good, or should I find a private trainer? Is Enzo still doing agility? Um, So I'm going to say what I'm going to say first, Kelly, and then I'm going to have you talk more, because you're really the more of the expert on dog training. Most everything I know about dog training I got, got from you. But I just said it's never too late to learn new things. So I say, go now, as soon as go do some kind of training. Um, And what I also believe, too, about the training and just obedience and then also agility or rally or any of these things that we do with our dogs is that um, it helps develop a bond with your dog. Um, And Mm -hmm. we speak... uh, a language that our dogs don't speak and they speak a language that we don't speak. And the training creates a a common language that you can understand each other. Is that a fair way of saying that Kelly? Yeah. You know, so that you can now, um, because they don't understand the English words that we're saying or whatever language you speak. um, And um, we don't understand their body language necessarily and mm-hmm. what's coming out. We of understand it. so much less of what they are telling us right. than what they understand of what we're telling yeah. them. So yeah. the the training is such a great way to develop and strengthen that bond and the communication. Mm-hmm. What would you mm-hmm. say? I, I can't speak to the big box pet store training and or a private trainer. I I don't I've never gone I went to training, but it was, you know, a class, but it wasn't one of the the pet stores. So I don't know about that training. Um, Mm -hmm. I can't speak to that. Oh, and the last thing, I have the last question is Enzo still doing agility. And the question, the answer is yes, when we can get in. But one of the things that happened with the pandemic is everybody got dogs and it's really difficult to get into class now. So we go and we can get get it in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so yeah, Jolene, I would say, no, it's definitely not too late. Um, A year and five months is really, really young. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a young dog. Mm -hmm. So for example, Barry, he was born in 2018. So what that makes him just had his last birthday was in February. So what that makes him five. And he's learning all kinds of things. Um Right now I'm working, in fact, I'm basically, I what, what I trained Bailey to do, you know, what, what I'm teaching Bailey at home, I'm also teaching Barry. Mm-hmm. So even though he's not as advanced in his training as she is, he's learning the same things. He's just at a different, he's just at a different level, mm-hmm. sort of behind, behind her just a little bit. Um, when he came, basically, because I couldn't, I couldn't bodily make him do something, because of his background and mm-hmm. I didn't want to get bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so I had to, I mean, I basically had to wait for him to get tired to lay down. Mm-hmm. And thankfully he was very heavy and got tired fast. Oh, now they're, now they know we're talking about them. Um, 
<laughs> and I I despaired of ever being able to teach him to lie down. He wouldn't lure, you know, I couldn't lure him down. I couldn't pull him down. All I could do was wait for him to lie down. Mm-hmm. And now down is his best. Mm-hmm. It's his best thing. Mm-hmm. When Because I focused so hard on it, once I finally got, a, you know, once I, because I wanted it so bad and I worked so hard at getting him to go down, finding ways to train him to, to down, and because that's a position I like my dogs to be in, mm-hmm. my most important things are down and stay. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, <laughs> don't be running around. Don't be, you know, getting into things. Don't be jumping on people. Don't be whatever they're doing. Down and stay helps them not mm-hmm. do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so so it's a really highly rewarded behavior at my house. And it's the first thing when he doesn't know what I'm trying to ask him to do is the first thing he'll try. Mm-hmm. So here I was thinking I We'll never be able to teach this dog how to do this. And now it's the thing he does best of, mm-hmm. <laughs> of everything. So, and he's five. So never too late. Um, and especially a dog like a Labradoodle uh, with that poodle background is going to be extremely smart. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it's only a matter of what you want to train. And I would say, you know, you can do a lot of training at home, like training tricks. Mm-hmm. It, if you if you learn how to teach your dog to do tricks, you've learned how to train your dog. Mm-hmm. And you can train all the other stuff you want in exactly the same way that you train them to do mm-hmm. a trick. It, they don't know the difference. Yeah. It's us that think one is, quote, obedience, mm-hmm. and the other one is tricks mm-hmm. and fun. Right. right. They have no idea of the difference. If right. we don't, If we didn't make that distinction, they will think it's all fun and tricks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think um big box big box pet store training is good because it's really about training the handler. Mm-hmm. It's not about training the dog. A private trainer would be great if you can do it mm-hmm. and you find a good and you find a good, you know, someone that you can actually work with and mm-hmm. and and knows a lot. It's not a very regulated industry, so that part about finding a class that what I say is good and that you, you know, you, that you like, that can be difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, if I were, my class is a class put on by a kennel club. Mm-hmm. So they teach obedience, you know, they teach it from the standpoint of, you know, learning to live with your dog, but also if you want to go on and do rally and dog sports, you know, mm-hmm. with your dog. And I would, I would have to say that's my bias. I might recommend that looking for a kennel club um, in your area and see if they have dog training classes. We have several. You know, Salinas Valley Dog Training Club has a class. Um, there's one in Watsonville. I can't remember what the name of that one is. Monterey Bay Dog Training Club, I think. And then there's um, Del Monte is where where we go. So there's like three dog training. Um, clubs in our area all of them all of them pretty much directed at obedience competition Mm -hmm. Um, but good you know good beginner classes for dogs to just learn how to be good yeah Yeah. uh, good house companions and have good manners but i agree with you about the bond yeah Um, training training gives the dog a chance to to uh, to see that you know you understand what they're saying mm -hmm. right yeah Uh, it's kind of, it kind of gives them a, 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 that thrill of, oh, wow, that stupid person who never, <laughs> never knows what I want actually did mm-hmm. realize what I wanted mm-hmm. from that. And that, that's a big help for the bond. Cause otherwise you can end up with a dog who, you know, knows what you, knows what you want, but doesn't think you understand anything about them. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the last thing I just as we were talking, the last thing I would add to this too is I think it's really important whether you uh, go to a box store, a private trainer, or try to do it you know do a class or try to do it on your own. It's really good to train your dog because it makes your life your dog's life more full and more rich. So if you have a dog that um, can't behave you know, out in public, then you can't take your dog to a walk and stop at a outdoor coffee shop and have a cup of coffee. You know, um, it's difficult to let them off leash at the dog park or at the beach. 
it's difficult to, um, if they react to other dogs or react to people, then it's difficult to, to have your friends come over or um, take them someplace, you know, it's so um, the more, the better behaved, the better manners they have, the f- more full and more rich their life is going to be and your life too, right? But otherwise, yes. yes, you know, they they just won't be able to go when you do th- right. do fun things. So um, anyway, um, does that answer that question, Kelly? Should we move on? I think so. I could talk about dog training I all day. I will say, I will say there are also online mm-hmm. training classes and I have done some of them and they're, they're different. It's kind of fun. My dogs are getting out of control. Oh, really? What are they doing? <laughs> Speaking of well-behaved dogs, what are your, what are your well-behaved dogs Bailey, doing? Bailey has <laughs> taken a sheet that w- was piled up on the spare room bed mm-hmm. and she's grabbed it off the bed and now she's, now she's got it in her mouth and she's rolling around with it and trying to entice Barry to play with her with this sheet. Mm-hmm. Okay, you guys have to go lie down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I will give a shout out to um, the one I've done classes from, uh, Fenzi, F-E-N-Z-I Dog Sports Academy. Mm-hmm. And they have they have webinars that are really low stakes. I think they're in like 20 to $30 for Mm -hmm. a a webinar um, where you just listen. And then they have classes that are short and then they have six week classes. And you, I've only just done the auditing of the classes. So I haven't actually been a participant where I take video and submit video of myself, Mm -hmm. but you can learn a lot just by watching Mm -hmm. other people's videos of training their dog, which, which you get to do. Um, the people who submit their videos, you get to, you know, it's like Ravelry has a discussion board and everything. And in the discussion board, they post videos of what they're doing. And then the trainer gives comments. And I've learned a lot from the classes that I've taken there. And they have tricks classes. They have, you know, agility classes. They have obedience classes. They have dog fitness classes. They have, they have all kinds of stuff. And you might find something that's interesting, but it, it will teach you, regardless of what the class is about, it will teach you about sort of the training mindset mm-hmm. and how to think about learning. Um, and I, I think that's real. well, of course, I like thinking about learning. I'm a mm-hmm. teacher. Um, it, it's all the same, right? Mm-hmm. Learning theory is learning theory. And so I find that to be really interesting. So yeah. there's yeah. another suggestion for you, Jolene. Okay. All right. And... um Kelly11 asked, uh, following on Janie's questions about fiber festivals, have either of you been to Rhinebeck? Any plans to go in the future? And um, I just said I would like to go to the Shetland Islands for Wool Week. That seems to be where a lot of people like to go there. And as far as Rhinebeck, I have not been to Rhinebeck. And I know, you, Kelly, you have not been there either. No, um, I haven't been there either. Kim and I I would like to go. Kim and I have been talking about it. And I wrote here, Kelly, in the show notes, I said, uh, it would be great to go, but Kelly, uh, with Kelly, but uh, damn that academic schedule. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> so that's the problem is Rhinebeck is in the fall um, and you're in school. So... Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Maryland sheep and wool is a little more, uh, probably a little more doable for me if I'm not retired. Mm-hmm. I think it's after the semester. It might be like toward the end of the semester or after the semester ends. So if I had a short course, you know, that ended early, um, I could probably make it to Maryland sheep and wool, but but yeah, I'd love to go. One day I'll go. Mm-hmm. I, I it's not off the table for sure. One day I will go, but it is not at a at a time that's easy for me to get away. Yeah. Um Okay, Yarn Girl 52, Debbie asked pockets. Uh, have either of you found one pocket style less apt to stretch out than others? Or is the <laughs> yarn um the deciding factor? I love pockets. And I said, I've never knit a sweater with pockets, mostly because I'm worried for the same reason that the pockets will bag out. Maybe I should think rethink my reluctance. So um, I don't know. 
thoughts on yeah pockets? I usually leave pockets out because I don't want to make pockets that then I will put my keys into. Mm-hmm. You know, at work, everywhere I go, I carry my keys. I don't, you know, I don't always carry a purse. Well, I rarely carry a purse at work. Um, I do have my briefcase, but you know, if I'm walking from one building to another, I don't always bring that briefcase. I'm just using my bringing my notebook or bringing my computer with me, and then I stuff my keys in my pockets. And so I have not put pockets in when they were in the pattern because I didn't want to be tempted to put my keys in those pockets and then rip them apart. Mm-hmm. over time mm-hmm. or stretch them out mm-hmm. you know so yeah um yeah i don't know this is something i think maybe we should have our listeners weigh in on yeah if anybody has some information for debbie about pockets that i think that would probably be really helpful because i'm not much help about it i just leave them off and not just debbie but for for us too because i there's a, a lot of sweaters i've seen that have pockets and i've just rejected them because of the pockets and that's mm-hmm. probably not fair you know i'm sure there's yeah. techniques um so yeah, are, are i have you- patch pockets on my or they're not patch pockets but they're they're like on that they're not on the seam right they're in the front of my sweater um the one i can't remember now what the name of it is forest Dark green forest, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. It's the one that I made out of the CVM, the Mm -hmm. the rust colored CVM. And those have pockets, but I, I have, I have made myself not use those pockets for anything other than Kleenex Mm -hmm. because, because I don't want to rip them out. And that's been hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've, I've had to be really strict with myself about that. So, yeah. When she also asks about luxury and oddball yarn, she says, I have only, I have one lonely skein of cashmere, nine not so lonely skeins of alpaca purchased for a sweater before I knew it would stretch, more alpaca fleece and yarn than I need, a braid of merino yak silk I'm afraid to dye because I don't want to ruin it. I could go on and on. Oh, alpaca lace and other lace weight yarns I don't usually knit with. Ideas? Well, it sounds like a lovely stash. <laughs> <laughs> so she, so I, I have to say she's looking for ideas about how to use these skeins of yarn. I think so. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So uh, I understand about. Uh, okay, the, I'm not answering these in any order, but the um, the braid of merino yak silk. I'm afraid to die because I don't want to ruin it. I say. Oh, that's a braid. So that means it's a uh, it's roving. It's, yes. Um, I think you should still say what you're going to say. Well, I say just dye it. And yeah, that's mean, what I was going to say too. Because you know what? There's more. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> and you and if you I, ruin it, you can always buy another one. Well, and I and what I was going to say is I don't think she will ruin it. I mean, this is right. I, I think that because right. as we've talked about forever, roving it keeps changing as you start. You know, you dye it, and mm-hmm. then you spin it, and then you ply it, mm-hmm. and then maybe you combine it with something else. You know, like you do a single and combine it with another single of another fiber or something. So right. I don't think you – she will not ruin it. I can guarantee you. Right. I'm just going on cut, record as saying she cannot ruin it. Just don't do a lot of stirring. It. Yeah. Just don't do a lot of stirring while yeah. you're – you yeah, know, you don't want it to fold out of the anything. dye pot. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. keep your spoon out of the dye pot while mm-hmm. it's dying. Yeah. Resist the urge to stir it. Yeah. And um, um and when it comes out, when it comes out, it's gonna look like you ruined it. Mm-hmm. Because it'll be all wet and matted together. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll look like it's all wet and matted together. Just ignore that and let it dry. Mm-hmm. And once it dries, you might have to do a little pre-drafting, but It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Just just resist the urge to stir it. Uh, okay, and then... Then alpaca lace and other lace weight yarns I don't usually knit with ideas. Do you want to know how to uh, how to use those? I mean, if you don't want to knit with lace, you could just combine the lace weight yarn with another yeah. yarn. I make- made two of my favorite hats that I made. Mm-hmm. Well, they're both the same, so one of them's a charity hat, but... One of the one of the things that I did was I took a lace weight yarn that I really liked and I t- and I put it with another another yarn that was like 
sport weight, I think. Mm-hmm. And I made a hat. And it turned out great. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, hats. Um, you could make, you could even make a shawl, you know, with, put the lace weight with something else. Alpaca with, held double with something else would be nice. You know, that would help if you're worried about the stretching. Yeah, um, that was, and I was going to say mm-hmm. too about the alpaca. Um, you know, if you are worried about stretching, like you could combine it with another yarn that might help with the stretching. The other thing is if you're concerned about stretching in a sweater, then make a shawl. Or a, mm-hmm. or a blanket. I don't know what the yardage is. Nine skeins. That's a lot. So then you don't have to worry about it. Garter yeah. squish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It would be beautiful. Mm-hmm. It would be beautiful in a garter squish blanket. Mm-hmm. It's so cozy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so hopefully we answered those questions. And then, yeah. Kelly, we're down to our last question. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> so Aaron says, longtime listener, I think early 2017, first time caller for the listener question show. I was wondering if there was a pre podcast project that you'd like to tell us about. It doesn't even have to have, it doesn't even have to be a playing with string project. I, for one, enjoy all the chatter about other stuff too. Um, so Kelly. Non-fiber related s- stuff prior to 2000. When, we, when did we start this podcast? <laughs> 200 episodes? Yeah, pre-podcast. Well, 200. actually, I'm going to say, I'm going to say a pre-prod, pre, pre, I can't even say that, pre, before the podcast mm-hmm. project, um, that is a yarn project. Um, one that I don't know if I've really talked about is the blanket that I made, um, it was a it was one of the first fleeces that I bought. It was a brown fleece. One of the first fleeces I bought from the the wool auction. My first fleeces were Cotswold from online. Uh, it was brown, pretty dark, and I over dyed it. And I think I think I might have dyed it in the wool before I spun it. I can't remember if I dyed. I'm pretty sure I dyed it in the wool and then spun it into yarn. But anyway, I over dyed it. I over dyed this fleece. So my first experience with over dyeing and I fell in love with the way the colors looked. Um, and I over dyed. I mean, so brown fleece, I over dyed it with magenta. I over dyed it with blue, green. I even over dyed it with yellow. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I over dyed it with paler colors and darker colors. And so I had all these colors and I made a woven blanket. So double weave because mm-hmm. the looms at work were not wide enough to make a blanket, a bed size blanket, um, you know, across. Mm-hmm. So it's double weave, which was fun. Um, but the, <laughs> the thing I really liked about it was it was so subtle, mm-hmm. right? The changes in the colors were really subtle. I still like that about it. I mm-hmm. love that blanket. You know which one I'm talking yes, about. Yes, I do. It's gorgeous. Um, but the teacher, the weaving teacher said, you, you really need, well, first she said, Kelly, if you're taking all this time to make tags so that you know which yarn is which color, Maybe it doesn't really matter because you can't really tell that they're different. <laughs> That's funny. So it was a little too subtle. And then she said, you really need a a contrasting color. Mm-hmm. You really need a contrasting color. And so I finally succumbed. I did not believe her. I didn't want to do it. But I thought, oh, well, I'll dye it and I'll bring it in. And then if I really don't like it, I don't have to put it in the blanket. Mm-hmm. So I dyed a, a dark pink on a white fleece and a green on a white, uh, like a limey green on a mm-hmm. white fleece and added that in and it made all the difference. Yeah. I mean, it it made that blanket beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, so that I think is one of the um, pre, before the podcast projects that, that I think... It was it was one of those things where I had an idea in my mind and I needed to be convinced to do something slightly different mm-hmm. than the idea that was in my mind. And I was so glad that that I listened. Yeah. It was a good lesson. Yeah. You know, it was a really good lesson. Plus it was a really fun project. Uh double weave, 
magic. Mm-hmm. Magic. You're going to have to do some double weave with your I know. Loom. I know. It is magic. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, what about I, you? Um, so pre-podcast projects um, for uh, in terms of like knitting or crafty, fibery sewing things. Um, uh, do you remember I made slip covers? I was my friend Dave. Yes. Well, this can this connects to fiber, and I, I think I mentioned this. Uh, maybe I didn't mention this in the podcast. I can't remember, but um, our our friend Dave who's always helped me with the sink and everything. We've been friends since middle school. And he lived in a big, huge house up on Capitol Hill. That's an area of Seattle, which had all these big houses. And um, he lived with his mother, father, siblings, and his grandmother. His grandmother actually owned the house and she had a loom. And in um, and it was one of, one of those big houses that actually had like a living room and then it had a parlor kind of, and it was in the parlor. And this is what I... I thought I said this in the podcast, but maybe I said it in the weaving class, but I always felt now I feel bad that they made his grandmother, he made his grandmother get rid of that loom because she hadn't been using it. She was older and hadn't been using it. Uh So they sold it and then redid the room. And my brother found all this old furniture because they didn't have a lot of money. He found all this old furniture that didn't look very good. And my job was to make slip covers. So he went to one of those, um, fabric places where they just have like bolts and bolts, you know, big giant bolts of fabric. Mm-hmm. And I bought just white canvas and it was, you know, like a dollar a yard or something. And I bought a lot of that canvas and I made white slip covers for two love seats and two chairs. Um, and I didn't know anything about making slip covers, but I made those. And I do remember, you know, I, I pin them um, on the sofas, the chairs, you know, um, inside out. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, inside out so I could figure out how they're going to fit. And then I would have to take it off the sofa and sew it on the machine. And then, you know, all those needles would – I like my hands were like completely <laughs> poked and bloody. Um, oh, my gosh, that. <laughs> and then I made curtains, our friend Gary – uh, didn't have curtains. And, and I, I actually, now that I think about this, Kelly, you know how you wrote me into a lot of things? My brother wrote yes. me into a lot of things. Yes. And so he <laughs> talked me into making curtains for Gary and they were wool. Uh, the part that you would see, you know, facing the room was wool. Then they were uh, interlined, which is like a thick uh, wool that goes between and then the lining is against the window. So the you know the lining's against the window, the inner lining, and then the wool was facing the 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 you know the interior of the room. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, you sew them on the sewing machine? No, you actually hand sew all of this stuff. So and had to make the pleats, and you put like a chain at the bottom. You sew in this chain to, so it gives it the weight, so it hangs. Oh my god, it was quite the quite the production. <laughs> And then I don't know if you remember this, but I um, um, made um, pillows for the school auction. Uh, oh, right. Mm-hmm. My brother's uh, firm was getting rid of all the long lines. He sold fabric, and they're getting rid of all these la- long lines. So I made all these pillows. I made about 25 pillows or th- a lot of pillows for the school auction, and they sold for about um, $10. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't sell for anything. So. Yeah. 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 So that was interesting. But then also, I guess the other thing, too, before we started, re- I mean, a lot of the stuff I was doing, you know, before we started recording was just raising Ben, you know. We've talked about that, mm-hmm. staying home with Ben. and But that's it in terms of projects. Um, yeah. I-, I guess another project that I would add uh, pre-podcast was – uh, at the house that we had before, uh, there had been an area, I think it was like a children's play area mm-hmm. that they had, you know, they had the lawn and then there was a, a a little, like, I think it was a children's play area. It didn't have a lawn. It didn't have anything there. Mm-hmm. I think it maybe had had, I want to say bark or something. I can't remember what it looked like when we first moved in, but I turned it into a garden, not mm-hmm. a vegetable garden, but a flower garden. Mm-hmm. And 
a little path through there. My compost was there, my little plant collection, because I guess I shouldn't call it a garden as much as it was a plant collection. Mm-hmm. That's a garden. Because <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of the way I like to garden, you know. Oh, this is an interesting plant. Let's get one of these. And so I created I created that out of a blank, you know, mm-hmm. kind of a blank slate at the other house. And that was a fun project. Mm-hmm. I haven't really I guess I've done some of that here, but not quite the same, not, not in quite the same way. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of blank slate out mm-hmm. there. <laughs> yeah. But but not in quite the same way. So that was really a fun project. We made all kinds of stepping stones and yeah. So yeah, that's a that's a good question too, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I I say I mean I did a lot of gardening, uh cooking, travel. We, you know, I we traveled a lot. I did those semester yeah. C program. Mm-hmm. I did that twice. Mm-hmm. Um so I did a lot of that kind of stuff, but that's non-fiber related, but anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, that's our last question. Yeah. So that was fun. An hour and a half. Oh my god. <laughs> Well, um, I really appreciate. You're still here. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, I really, I it's uh, I really appreciate the questions. It was really kind of fun to think about all of this stuff. Um, There's a lot of things Mm -hmm. like I like. It made me think about those slip covers. It made me think about those pillows that I made and my first projects. And it made me think about a lot of things. So it's it's it was nice to. um, It was fun to go through all these questions. Yeah. 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 Well, and it's kind of like now, I mean, people who have l- been listening a long time, they know us pretty well, mm-hmm. right? Because they've heard so much, but now they know us more like the way we know each other <laughs> from mm-hmm. all those years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of like, kind of like they had to sit through the, s- <laughs> the vacation slides. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. Yep. These are the, these are the vacation slides. Yeah, you guys have been treated to the equivalent of the vacation slides. <laughs> okay. All right. All well, right. I think with that, we will conclude and we'll be back in two weeks. Actually, well, and yes. I'm, um, we'll figure out our schedule, Kelly, because as we've talked about, I'm coming down. I leave on the 27th to come to mm-hmm. visit you and then go to uh, Stitches West, which I believe I don't have the dates in front of me now. Does it start on the second or the third? Oh, I don't. I shouldn't say that. Yes, uh, I'm going to say. I'm just going to say yes. Yes, <laughs> one of those. Two one of those is the right day. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. So yeah, so you'll be here in a week. Yeah, yeah. It's Sunday, and you'll be here a week from tomorrow. A week from tomorrow, yeah. So. Nice. Um, so clean my room, get it ready for me. I know, I know. <laughs> well, it's a bi- a whole bunch of stuff is piled on the bed. That's where uh, Bailey grabbed the uh-huh. the sheet and was uh, shaking it all around the <laughs> all around the room while we were talking. Mm-hmm. I have them in here with me because Robert was at the store mm. uh, when I started recording, so I brought them in here with me, and they are ready to get out of this room. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Probably like our listeners are ready to get off the. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, with that, we'll say goodbye. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. To subscribe to the podcast, visit 2usefiberadventures.com. Join us on our adventures on Ravelry and Instagram. I am Better in Motion and Kelly is 100 Projects. Until next time, we're the 2us doing doing our our part part for World Fleece. Fleece.